No one will ever know what were the last thoughts of the Scorpion King. Maybe he was satisfied with his work and knew deep down that he would never be forgotten. Or maybe he was frustrated because he had not completed his ambition in life. Egypt was still broken. But what we know is that his dream will not die with him. A new king will arise to fulfill it. King Namer. He has come to us. He has taken the land of the world. The double crown is placed on his head. He has come. He has united the two lands. He has joined the kingdom of the upper land with the lower. He has come. He has ruled Egypt. He has placed the desert in his power. He has come, he has protected the two lands, he has given peace in the two regions. He has come, he has made Egypt to live, he has destroyed its afflictions. He has come, we bring up our children. We bury our aged by his good favor. He has come to us. He has come to us. Once again, the origins of a protagonist are buried in mystery. According to later sources, he was originally from Tijeni, the capital of the Scorpion King and his descendants. But some historians wonder if he is not from Nekham, a city known for its cult of the god Horus, and where we have founded many traces of his reign. Among these the most famous is undoubtedly the Narmer Palette. The only clue we have of how Egypt was unified. There is still a great debate among historians as to whether the palette was created to mark a great military victory or if it served to be a visual metaphor for the king's role as protector of the kingdom. Either way, Everyone agrees that the palette conveys a message that we can try to understand. Let's start with the most famous scene of the composition. In the center, Namer wears the white hadjet crown, symbol of his power over Upper Egypt. He is also to the point of crushing his enemy head, as he stands over the corpse of other opponents of his helm. However, despite the violence of his act, his expression is devoid of any sadism or anger. He is not going to commit an aggression, but a ritual to restore the will of the gods, disturbed by those who intervened against him. Speaking of them, they are also present in the palette. The falcon god Horus stands on a papyrus flower, plant 
widely found in Lower Egypt. In his claws, he hold a hope-like object, which appeared to be attached to a nose of a man's head, indicating perhaps that he is drawing life from the head. At the top, the king's name is protected by two representations of the cow goddess Hathor, whose name means the House of Horus. We can also find other elements that will become iconic in Egyptian iconography. The king wears a false beard, a symbol of wisdom, and a belt in the shape of a tail of a lion or a taurus, symbol of power. Finally, behind the king, a servant brings his sandals, a very luxurious item at the time. Strength, wisdom and power, those are the attributes of a true king. On the other side of the palette, we can find an armor wearing Deshet, the red crown of Lower Egypt, and a parade of his victorious troops. The beheaded corpses of their enemies are also on display. The larger scene on this side is pretty mysterious. Two strange long necked creatures are tamed by ropes. Some interpret the image as the unification of the two lands, others as the power of the king being capable of controlling the chaos of the cosmos. Finally, we can find Narmer again, but this time he has taken the form of a bull, which crushes its enemies and destroys the walls of a city. Nothing can stop his power. This palette is iconic. But did the unification happen only to violence, like this image seems to indicate? One name seems to contradict this theory. Nif Hotep, Egypt's first queen and wife of Narmer. She was named in homage of the goddess Nif, which was very popular in the north. Perhaps his marriage was a means to bring together the two royal families. So, what can we conclude? Namer was the one who finished the work of the scorpion, finalizing the conquest of the north and stabilizing his power. However, another mystery surrounds Namer. Why, in the king list, created by Egyptians with the name of all the sovereigns of Egypt, the first one is always called Menes. The most accepted theory is that Menes and Namer are the same person. The word Menes means he who endures, which could be a title or an indication that the office of king was greater than individual. The man seated on the throne is mortal, but his office is eternal. Unifying Egypt was only the beginning for Namer. He decided that his kingdom needed a new capital. The famous city of Inebu Hedju was his choice. According to legend, he was the founder of the capital, whose name means the White Walls. However, in 2012, evidence was found indicating that the city existed at the time of the king Iri Horus, two generations before the rise of Namer. Perhaps the first king did not build it from the ground, but reform it to accommodate his skirt. What's certain is that when he arrived, he dedicated a temple to the local deity Ptah. But Inebu Hedju, which over time changed his name to Inebd Hedj, was not the only town that Nemer built. Legend tells that one day the king was chased by rabid dogs and threw himself into a lake to save his life. However, the animals continued his pursuit and Nemer would have died had he not been saved by crocodiles. To thank the god Sobek, patron of these creatures, he founded the city of Shedet. Economy was not neglected, 
ambassadors were sent to Phoenicia, Byblos, and Canaan to establish trade routes. Egypt imposed itself on the international scene. Once the citizen rows of the living were built and flourishing, the moment arrived to prepare those of the dead. Around the capital, many mastabas were built to accommodate the king, his family and nobility. Only legends tell us about the last days of Namer. They said that after 62 years of reign, he was killed by hypos. As his son Hor Aha was too young to assume the throne, his mother Nifhotep assumed the regency. After the death of Hor Aha, whose reign was marked by great religious and military activity, the new king Djer followed the example of his grandfather and married a nobleman from the north, Mer Nif, who also followed the example of the first queen by assuming the regency when her son Djet arrived at the throne too young to reign. Even if some historians wonder if Merinif would not have fully assumed the role as Lord of Egypt, as Hapshetsut will do a few centuries later. Once a full grown man, Diger would be a great king and his reign will be marked by many innovations. Alas, the reign of his descendant, Anebjip, would not be so blessed as it was marked by violence between the north and the south. Apparently, the king met a tragic end, as his successor and rival, Sermakhat, allegedly tried to erase his name. He will be remembered by history as an usurper. Sermakhat's son, Ka, would be unable to tame the chaos created by his father, giving way to a new dynasty under the hands of Hotep Sekham Wi, then Haneb, Ninetjer, and Peribsen, who took the controversial decision to take Set as royal totality deity instead of Horus. His decision was probably made by the increase of influence of Lower Egypt, from where the cult of Set came long ago. But it was in vain. The reign of his successor, Kazehamwi, would be marked by a period of civil war, which ended with a marriage with Nematrap, a nobleman of the north, known as the mother of a new dynasty. But even with this chaotic ending, the descendants of Namer laid the foundations for building a great civilization. Egypt was ready to make a big leap forward. Or, to put it better, a leap to the sky.